Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our chapel speaker this morning is Dr. Ron Rhodes. He is the president of Reasoning from Scriptures Ministry, which is an apologetics organization located in Frisco, Texas. Ron received both his THM as well as his THD degree in systematic theology from Dallas Seminary. He's a prolific author. He has taught apologetics at a number of seminaries, including our own. He's co-host of the National Bible Answer Man broadcast for seven years. He served in that capacity. And he and his wife, Carrie, live in Texas. And uh, their children, David and Kylie, both attend Baylor University. Uh, Ron, it's a privilege to have you back. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Rhodes? Well, good morning. You know, I remember years ago, I took eschatology with Dr. John F. Wolverd, and uh, you know, we were talking about the rapture one day. You all know that he wrote the definitive book on defending the pre-trib rapture, and uh, there's no way that you're going to budge him on the rapture. I mean, let's just face it. And so one day, I raised my hand, and I said, well, Dr. Wolverd, what if all of a sudden you find yourself in the tribulation? You could have heard a pin drop in there. I'm thinking to myself, oh no, I'm going to be kicked out of Dallas Seminary because I asked the wrong question. You know? <laughs> but then he got this little grin on his face and he said, well, maybe I'll write a new book called Rethinking the Rapture. <laughs> but you know, one thing I really loved about Dr. Wolverd and all the other professors here is that they stood strong on the Word of God. They wouldn't budge on the Word of God. And that's really uh, the motivation behind my message today. We so need to stand strong on the Word of God because of the truth that's penetrating the church today. And I'm going to give you some evidence for that. Now, before I do that, I want to draw a distinction between learning by description and learning by acquaintance. Uh, learning by description is when you look at books and read articles and so forth. And that is a good way to learn. I mean, I do that. But it's also good to learn by acquaintance. And that's when you spend time with pastors and their churches and the congregation members and counseling with church members. And you see, one of the great things that I get to do in my ministry is that I get to go out there and speak at hundreds of churches from you know, California to Philadelphia. In fact, over the last 30 days alone, I've spoken in churches from the West Coast to the East Coast. And by interacting with people, I'm able to find out a lot of the stuff that people are going through. And the fact is, is that because of the many books I've written on cult apologetics, a lot of times people come up and talk to me about things that are going on in their own churches. Or they might ask about their brother or their mother or their father or their sister or their best friend who's fallen into some kind of a, a deviant doctrine. And so really, I'd love to have three hours with you today, but I don't have three hours to talk about all the problems in the church today. But you've got stuff like paganism and Wicca and what I call Oprahized books. Anybody here watch Oprah on occasion? Okay, I'm gonna need to write your name down. Okay, I'll be counseling with you after today. The fact is, is that I'm going to have to narrow my attention to a very short survey of, uh, you know, some, some key errors in the church. It all begins with a question that was asked of me about six or seven years ago by a president of a major Christian university. And this president asked me, what do you see coming in the next five or six years that might do injury to the church? And without hesitation, I said, I really feel like we're going to see an explosion of subjectivism, experientialism, and mysticism, along with occultism and some paganism. And his eyes kind of got a little bit wide when I said all that stuff. But I think if you look over the last five to seven years, you see some substantiation that that's absolutely correct. We've seen a virtual explosion of these ideas in the church. And what I want to do today is to talk about how it's confused people. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but if you were driving around one day and you came across a sign like this and it says good luck, well, I got to tell you, I think a lot of people today feel that same way when it comes to religion in America. There are so many ideas and so many religions and even within Christianity, there are so many denominations. And even within the denominations, you've got this church that buys into that doctrine and this church that buys into the other doctrine. Some have fallen into this Do, you know, doctrinal error, well, others have fallen into some other doctrinal error. And so it's confusing to the average Christian. And as I go out there and speak in these churches, I encounter this stuff all the time. 
Uh, in a way, you might consider this to be a report from the front lines instead of just a survey uh, done by pollsters. Now, isn't this a great picture? It illustrates a wonderful truth, and that is that uh, false prophets come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You see, very often I have found that cultists look good on the outside. They seem to have answers, but in reality, their answers are deadly. And that's really what makes a lot of this a little bit more complicated because some of these guys are pretty smart. You know, when I do research for this stuff, I don't just read books by the cultists themselves. I go and meet with them. I go and meet with the presidents. I go and watch psychics do their thing. I go and I listen to lectures by, for example, Deepak Chopra, major new ager. You see, that's firsthand research that I do. And as I do that, I discover some of the stuff that's gonna be passed on to people like you and people who watch television, like the Oprah Winfrey Show. Now today, I'm gonna to limit my attention to three things, and it all relates to truth decay. Uh, I hope you don't have a toothache by the time we're done today. But uh, in any event, psychic phenomena in the church, Wicca or witchcraft in the church, and altered states of consciousness in the church. So stay tuned, strap on your seatbelt, we're gonna move pretty quickly. I'm gonna begin with psychic phenomena in the church. Uh, I'll begin by talking about Bob in Downey, California. The family of Bob came up to me after a service that I spoke at and said, you know, uh, Bob's wife died just a few months ago. Uh, she was 30 years old, and he's 30 years old, and uh, you know, he's been going to see a Christian psychic. A Christian psychic. Is, is that okay? Is it okay for Bob to continue this? And she, this psychic said that she wasn't in any way violating you know, those verses in the Old Testament that talk about occultism. She's a Christian psychic, and she says she has a gift of the Holy Spirit, you see. And so I had to say, well, I'm, I'm afraid that that's an oxymoron. You know, there's no such thing as a Christian psychic, and you need to get Bob out of that as soon as possible. Uh, such a thing is an abomination to God, and I had to tell the truth in the name of Jesus Christ. But it made me wonder, why are Christians open to this these days? You know, as I go around to different churches and I start to discover a number of people consulting with Christian psychics, that raises red flags in my mind. When I receive emails from all around the country, and we receive between two and 300 a day, when a lot of those deal with this issue of Christian psychics, that gets my attention. So there's a lot of people falling for this out there, apparently. But why? Why are Christians buying into this? I think that they're being impacted by our culture today. Did you know this past season, 14 of the pilots of new TV shows were paranormal in nature? Did you know that Hollywood is reporting that these shows have among the highest ratings out there? And that's why they keep on coming and going. Uh, Ghost Whisperer would be one example. I have to watch these kinds of shows because of my research, as well as movies for my research. And uh, just to give you one example, on this show, a little boy died as a result of not obeying mama one day. And throughout the rest of the show, Mama and this little boy in the great beyond are trying to communicate with each other through this psychic or medium. By the end of the show, tears are streaming down their faces as they communicate with each other. And violins are playing in the background. And how can it be wrong if it feels so right? You see, we're being brainwashed. Psychic phenomena is being whitewashed before our very eyes. Same thing is true of movies. I wish I had time to talk about all these, but I don't. The most recent is Charlie St. Cloud with Zac Efron. And in each case, we find occultism or psychic phenomena being whitewashed. And you better believe that there are Christians who are reading and watching these kinds of things. Uh, Sylvia Brown is one of the major culprits. Uh, Sylvia Brown is one of the major psychics of our day, and I've read all her books. In fact, I've read all the books by all the major psychics. You're probably worried about me, and you, you, you've said to yourselves, well, how can this guy read all those bad books and still be okay? I've mentioned before to you that my wife, Carrie, watches after me. She makes me read two Christian books for every weird book. Right? <laughs> it's good to have a good wife, right? She also makes me keep all of my weird books in this one room at the far corner of our house. I think she thinks they're levitating around in there, you know? <laughs> the funny thing is, that's where our guest bed is. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. We're never staying at that guy's house. But be that as it may, she often sounds Christian whenever you see Sylvia Brown on TV. Uh, she refers to God and Christ during her television appearances. She claims to do everything by the grace of God. She says she has a gift of the Holy Spirit, and she says that she's on a mission for God. And I want you to get this as well. 
Uh, she claims that there will be many false prophets that rise up proclaiming to be Jesus on earth and try to lead people astray, and we're already seeing this in the big rise of occultism. <laughs> now, you see what's going on here, right? You see, you've got these people warning against occultism, and it makes it look like she's one of the good people. Stay away from those bad psychics. Only affiliate with those of us who have a gift of the Holy Spirit. We won't lead you astray because God is on our side. Don't get into that demonic stuff. This is very seductive stuff, and this is one of the reasons why Christians are falling for it. They just don't know the Bible well enough to refute it. Did you know that the current polls indicate that 38% of Americans believe ghosts or spirits can come back to visit us? That's 113 million Americans, and you better believe that Christians are in there. 28% of Americans think that people can communicate with the dead. That's one out of every four. That amounts to 83 million Americans. And did you know that 73% of our teens have participated in psychic activities this past year? And among our church-going teenagers, only 28% say they've been taught anything in church to help them understand such phenomena. You see, what we're seeing is that the culture's bombarding us with psychic phenomena, and the church is doing very little. That's why I like doing what I do. See, I get to go to these churches, and I, I get to raise their discernment level. And we need more people out there. There's a big harvest out there, but we need a lot more harvesters to participate. Now, that's given rise to the Christian psychic movement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's one comment from the head of an association. We are real psychics, honest and accurate, who make a 110% effort for you and your issues. We receive our impressions and intuitions and information from the Holy Spirit as the spirit of prophecy, as mentioned in Revelation 19. So there you have it. There is a hybrid out there called Christian psychics, and we've got to be discerning today. Yet another group is Christian Wiccans. This is Christian witches, and it may surprise you to hear about this. It involves a blending of Wicca and Christianity. Now here you see a picture of a Christian Wiccan. And if you'd just allow me, I would like to read her testimony. Uh, I was born into a practically atheist home and found Christianity at the age of 14. I started studying some other religions. I have not been able to go too far at this time due to a lack of funds and a good library, but I started studying the book Earth Power by Scott Cunningham and started to dabble in some of its practices and a few others. I purchased The Craft by Dorothy Morrison and Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner by Scott Cunningham, and I found myself in a faith I could truly hold dear to my heart. And this is a young teenager. She goes on. I did, however, feel somewhat empty still. Jesus has been a part of my life for almost three years and has helped me become who I am today. So I started looking into Christian Wicca or Christian witchcraft back then. I follow the Wiccan read. Uh, this is their ethical principle that says, do whatever you want so long as it doesn't harm anybody else. So she says, I follow the Wiccan read, but I also take the Ten Commandments to heart greatly. You should not hold any gods before me. This is one that people really don't get when it comes to my beliefs. I believe that there is only one true God and that all other gods are part of the one. The Christian Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is also somewhat of a reflection of this. I view it as God, Goddess, or the Holy Spirit, and Jesus all still being part of one being. Sounds like Hinduism in a way, doesn't it? Now notice the symbol. There is a five-pointed star surrounded by a circle in the background. That's the common Wiccan symbol representing the four elements of the earth plus the spirit, the goddess spirit that indwells the earth. And then you see a crucifix. And as you read, uh, you know, um, horizontally, it says God. If you read it vertically, it says goddess. And again, you see the Wiccan star right on the cross. So, I mean, this is the symbol that they use. And this is a growing movement, especially among teenagers today. Uh, in terms of uh, their view of God, they believe in the Father and the Son and the Mother, which is the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is considered a Christian pantheon. Lots of teenagers buying into this. In terms of their practices, uh, not only do they foster a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they believe in eight Wiccan Sabbaths, which are the holidays of the witches. They believe in 13 Esbats, which are the annual coven meetings, and they hold to the Wiccan read. And most important, they urge silence. Do not tell your Christian parents what you're doing. If you're a Christian Wicca who is a teenager, do not tell your parents because they will get you out of it. So make sure that whatever you do, you don't tell them. Now can you see how seductive and evil all of this is? Can you see the battle that we've got before us in terms of apologetics? Well, it gets worse. 
Uh, there's also mysticism or altered states of consciousness penetrating the Christian church. And out of the three groups I'm, I'm covering today, this has got to be the biggest. Uh, what we're finding is deep breathing and proper posture in, in order to go into a deep state of consciousness. Uh, yoga, chanting like Benedictine monks, the use of mantras, contemplative prayer, and all of these are supposed to yield a richer, more authentic spiritual experience. And there's a lot of this in the emerging church movement, which I really don't have time to talk about. But I will say this about contemplative prayer. Not long ago, there was an article in Publishers Weekly which said, many Protestants are looking to satisfy that yearning for the transcendental and the mystical by a return to the Eastern contemplative tradition. I want to stop for a minute. There are some Christians I've talked to who say that by contemplative prayer, they just mean being silent before God and yielding their hearts to God and having silent worship before God. If that's what you mean, then that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. But you know what? If you believe what some of the people today are teaching, such as Richard Foster, to me that sounds like a TM Christian hybrid, TM being Transcendental Meditation. What is the goal of contemplative prayer? To this question, the old writers answer with one voice, union with God. Our final goal is union with God, which is a pure relationship where we see nothing. Thomas Keating agrees. He's one of the most popular people in this movement, writing on this movement. Contemplative prayer is the opening of mind and heart, our whole being to God, the ultimate mystery, beyond thoughts, words, and emotions. And as for reason, you better get rid of it. Because as Foster says, it's only when we are willing to abandon our very limited human modes of thought and concepts and open a welcoming space to, that the spirit will begin to operate in us at this divine level. When we center, we practice leaving our human thoughts and reason behind and attending to the divine or to the spirit. That doesn't sound like Christianity, my friends. That sounds more like TM, and believe me, I've read everything out there on TM by the promoters of TM. I know what I'm talking about here. This is a crossing the line and tainting Christianity with a false religion. Brennan Manning, one of the most popular guys out there, even among Protestants, is being recommended by Max Lucado and Michael W. Smith, the popular singer. Uh, listen to what he says. We need to be using mantras as Christians. Choose a single sacred word and repeat the sacred word inwardly, slowly and often. Enter into the great silence of God. Alone in that silence, the noise within will subside and the voice of love will be heard. You know what one of the recommended words is? Maranatha. Keep on repeating Maranatha over and over again and you will attain a higher state of consciousness. You know, the translation uh, of this word mantra is very significant. It comes from the Sanskrit man, which means to think, and tra, which means to be liberated from. Mantra means to escape from thought. And by repeating the mantra, either out loud or silently, the word or phrase fades into the background and your consciousness moves inward. And you gain what people call a cosmic consciousness, a sense of oneness with everything that is around you. Now, why is this a movement very, very popular in the emerging church? Well, D.A. Carson tells us this. For almost everyone within the movement, there is an emphasis on feeling and affections over against linear thought and rationality, on experience over against the truth. Dan Kimball says, the basis of learning has shifted from logic and rational, systematic thought to the realm of experience. People increasingly long for the mystical and the spiritual rather than the evidential and facts-based faith. One of my good friends, a guy that I do conferences with out there, he works with me on the front lines, Gary Gilley. He notes the backward reasoning. The old paradigm taught that if you had the right teaching, you will experience God. The new paradigm says that if you experience God, then you will have the right teaching. I gotta tell you folks, this is on an epidemic level out there. You have no idea how often I confront this as I go from church to church out there. You have no idea how many hundreds of emails I receive annually from people mixed up in this stuff. As you know, Christian meditation is something that is good. It's where we focus on the Bible. You know, the Hebrew word carries this idea of murmur. If you can picture, for example, David meditating on Scripture, he's reading it so intently that his lips are moving as he reads it. You see, it's very objective. And the more he drinks in the word of God, the more excited and built up his faith gets. That's biblical meditation. But this kind of meditation that's getting so popular in the emerging church, this is a TM Christian hybrid. 
and it ought to raise red flags in each of our minds. So what have we seen briefly today? We've seen occultism penetrating the church. We've seen paganism penetrating the church. We've seen mysticism penetrating the church. I hope you agree with me, we've got a problem. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. You know, normally when I talk about this stuff, I spend maybe two or three hours on each topic. But my wife, Carrie, says, Ron, get them out on time, okay? So I'm gonna get you out on time today, but I just want you to know, this is the tip of the iceberg. And just as a report from the front lines, we've got huge, huge difficulties in the Christian church today. What do these different groups have in common? Well, there's a lot we could talk about, but among the commonalities would be the feeling that the Christian church is missing something, a weak knowledge of the Bible and theology, and in some cases, an outright rejection of theology and the Bible, and then third, a commitment to a religious idea that is merged with and contaminates biblical Christianity. We've got a variety of hybrid religions emerging in our very midst. And some of you guys uh, that are gonna go out to work in churches this next year, you need to be aware of this stuff. You need to be aware of it. And this brings me to 2 Timothy 4, verses one to four, and basically I just wanna close with a brief exhortation to you. I'm not gonna do any thorough exegesis here, but I just want to sort of give you the map first. Verse one involves the motive for preaching. Verse two, the mandate for preaching. Verses three and four, it's what I call preventive preaching. And then verse five, a ministry fulfilled. So what am I talking about here? Well, in verse one, we find the motive for preaching. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. And then I wanna stop right there. You see, we've got an audience. When I speak, my audience is not just you. My audience is God himself and the Lord Jesus. And I'm gonna stand before the judgment one day. And I'm gonna give an account for the words that I spoke from arenas like this, you see. And so what I wanna do is to preach the truth and be found worthy at the judgment seat of Christ. And I've got to tell you that I believe that people like you and me who are gonna be preaching the truth from the pulpit or on the missionary field, we're gonna have a higher standard. We're gonna be held accountable for standing for doctrinal truth and for standing against doctrinal error. What do I base that upon? Well, you remember the seven churches of Asia Minor in the book of Revelation? Look at what Jesus said to the Ephesians. He commended them. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. Way to go, Jesus said. Well done. You've done exactly what you're supposed to have done. You stood against those people who are claiming to be false, claiming to be apostles but in fact are false. You see, I think that that's gonna come up at the judgment for each one of us. Likewise, if we don't stand for truth, if we don't stand against false ideas out there, we may receive words similar as those given to the Thyatirans. I have this against you, Jesus says. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I think it's gonna come up, guys. My encouragement to you is to make sure that you speak the truth, not only in favor of what's orthodox, but take a stand against the many attacks against orthodox Christianity that are out there today. Number two is the mandate for preaching. The motive is in verse one, the mandate is in verse two. It says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Re reprove and rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. All right, underline that word ready. You know, the only way to really be ready, the only way to be ready is if you understand some of the competing ideas out there, like occultism, paganism, and mysticism. You, you know one of the big misnomers that I encounter with people going to seminary? They think that without studying all this stuff in cultism and occultism, they're automatically ready to confront these errors out there just by what they know about the Bible. Listen guys, I've been doing this for 25 years and I'm still not fully ready. You need to take it seriously. You need to prepare yourselves for what's gonna confront you out there because I promise you, if you do not speak boldly on behalf of the truth and against error, the false religions out there will speak boldly. They will do it, so we must be ready. There are two key benefits to preaching related to this issue. First of all, preaching doctrine builds the faith of believers so that they become increasingly inoculated against cultic errors. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, amen? 
Preaching doctrine also has a corrective and protective nature. Watch your life and doctrine closely, Paul tells Timothy. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. You see, the church was being penetrated by error even back then. And so Paul says, you you stand on the truth and you defend the truth and you preach the truth and you will save both yourself and your hearers. That's what we need to do by preaching. And then verses three and four, what I call preventive preaching. Now there's a number of different angles that we could approach these verses with, but I've chose preventive preaching because to me, uh, these verses talk about a problem that not only dealt with something back in the, the New Testament times, but they're just as relevant today. Listen to these words. The time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Is that not what is happening in our own day today? As you look at the culture around us and you look at the occultism and the mysticism and the paganism and all the other stuff, The reason why Timothy was to preach the word was because a time was coming where people would plummet into religious falsehood. And my point is simply this. To the extent that you are successful regarding this mandate for preaching the truth in verse two, to that same extent you will deliver many from falling prey to the false religious ideas alluded to in verses three and four. So never give up, Paul says, to fulfill your ministry. I gotta tell you something, folks. As I've worked out there in churches, The churches that regularly preach the word of God, those churches that have youth ministers that preach the word of God to their teenagers, those churches that feature Bible studies, those are the churches with the least problems that I've mentioned to you today. My challenge, therefore, is to preach the word of God and to make sure the word of God permeates every aspect of your church because that is the number one thing that will stop the growth in its tracks of occultism and mysticism and other such things in the church. Just to give you a little added fire here, did you know that according to exit counseling done at Wellspring, this is a a counseling center I'm I'm acquainted with and have worked with in the past, it's actually a a counseling center that cultists go to who have become Christians, and they go there to be sort of deprogrammed and reintroduced into society. Did you know that 25% of all the people who join up with these false groups come out of a good Bible-believing church. I'm talking about a good Bible-believing church. Another 40% come from one of the larger uh, liberal denominations out there. That tells me one thing. The church is not reaching people with the word of God. You see, one of the things I've always appreciated about Dallas Seminary is that Dallas grads do stand for the word of God. There are so many seminaries out there that are producing preachers who just speak fluff fluff in the pulpit. Believe me, we don't need that. We need preachers who will preach the word of God and not shy away from it. And I'm gonna encourage you to be healthy. Stay healthy in your preaching. Why do I say that? I say that because today there is a hideous disease that has plagued Christian leaders and preachers from the pulpit. It's a hideous disease called non rockabotus We've got Christians out there so afraid to rock the boat for Jesus Christ. What I'm encouraging people to do who are hearing my voice today, whether live or over the tape, is to take a stand in the name of Jesus Christ, to tell the truth in the name of Jesus Christ, and to be bold and not shy away when that cold, harsh wind of political correctness comes against you. Be bold enough to take a stand for the Lord, I really believe that we need a holy baptism of boldness to fall upon the church because what with all the false religions and the new atheists, we're starting to cower backward. You see, we're in retreat. I say charge forward and let's not let up. Just let the word ring forth that truth will go forth no matter what the cost. That's been my policy and I can tell you that as a result of that policy, there are virtually thousands and thousands of people through our ministry that have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and have entered into the kingdom of light of Jesus Christ. And I gotta tell you folks, there's nothing like watching a cultist come to know Jesus Christ. But you see, we've got a worse problem. We need to make sure that people in our church don't get mixed up in cultic ideas. So will you take it seriously? I pray that you do. The problem is real, 
It is a growing problem, and if we don't act, pray tell me who will. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are so thankful that you have given us the word of God as the barometer of truth against which we can test all other truth claims. Thank you for the word of God that not only teaches us the plan of salvation and how to come to know Jesus Christ, but we thank you for the warnings against false ideas and false religions. And we thank you for the instructions on how we are to handle these false ideas. My Father, I ask that every person listening to my voice today will have a true boldness in their hearts to go forth and speak the truth. We thank you. We worship you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.